Hello. Oh. Oh, Larry, you're fighting the life out of me. Oh. George Russell! Yes, sir. <laughs> Do you mind? As a matter of fact, I don't. Quick. Oh. Which one did this belong to? If you were a gentleman, you'd close your eyes. <laughs> Caesar still lives. You mean he's not dead? You catch on quick. With your brains and my beauty, we could go places. Now I've heard everything. Who else in this house could possibly be on a pill? <laughs> bye, Mum. Bye, Dad. <laughs> oh, very unsettling, this. Don't faint now. Wait till after. I'd do anything for you. You know that. There's a lot of women think I'm very attractive. Only women who aren't as good looking as you are. You can laugh, mate. You watch tonight, I'll murder him. You watch the old James technique come into play. I've always said that the most difficult thing in show business is to be yourself. And Sid was always Sid. Oh! Shh! It's all right, don't scream. What do you want? Well, that's very nice of you, but I haven't got the time. Sid never changed. He had this peeled tangerine face. And he, he, I think he probably had it when he was 11. Ten minutes can make you look ten years younger. <laughs> I'll give it a couple of hours, I think. People used to say he had a face like an old glove. I think that summed up Sid James. My face? When you look like that, <gasps> I think you set out to surmount what you may consider, most people consider a handicap, by developing a good, benign personality. It's hard to think that anything like this could contribute <laughs> to success. It must have had some kind of help, I suppose. I don't really know. The voice and the face were well matched. Yes, there wasn't an odd pair of socks situation about those two, was there? You'd think, oh, he could be a bit of a heavy, a gangster. But when he spoke and he had that tone in his voice, that's when all the warmth came out. Come gather round, mates, while I sing this strange tale. T'was a bright winter day when we sighted a sail and captured a treasure of fine silver plate. And 500 Spanish pieces of eight. Oh, the ocean is wide and the ocean is cold. And they say there's a black curse upon pirate gold. He never told me much about himself, uh, except to say, if you've got any money, Vince, invest in diamonds. They'll always increase in value, and I think that's what he did. He invested in diamonds. What all the boys are wearing? Plain gold signet. Nice little centre diamond star cut. The distinctive. Twist. You know something? For you, a tie pin would be nice. I met Sid for the first time doing children's radio in Johannesburg, and. He was a lovely chap, he was full of fun, full of laughter. I don't know that he took it too seriously. I think it was just at that time he was actually a hairdresser. He used to come in from his business fed up with the monstrosities, of the attitudes of the women he had to deal with, or smiling, smiling, because they'd tipped him nicely or treated him well or said complimentary things about him. Well, you can't say I haven't worked for it. And then I think he just took the radio as a sort of fun thing to do. Before he became really professional, we had joined the entertainment unit, South African entertainment unit, going out and playing to the troops. Sid was already way up as the lieutenant in charge of a lot of these concert parties and enjoying every minute of it. He loved doing the comedy. He had that comedy in him. Well, the war finished. Everybody wanted to go to England in the profession if you wanted to act. He came like a travelling salesman with a bag of talent and a predetermined plan of how to get the right people to look at his wares and his samples. Sid was a go-getter, and the first thing he did was get himself a publicist and a good agent, and he scored from there. He hadn't been here six weeks before he was already doing work in the film studios. What that copper want you for? He was checking on that car you sold me. Yeah? Why don't you tell me you knocked it off, Johnny? Speak up, big mouth. Somebody near you down the street. Well, why didn't you? I've got to live, ain't I? If I told you it was bent, you'd have done me on the deal. And if it's one thing I hate, it's being done. Well, all I can say is it's a lucky thing for both of us I got rid of it when I did. They got any proof you ever had it? Nah. They think the bloke you pinched it from knocked it off. The, the geezer from Banks' garage? That's right. 
What makes him think he nicked it? Because he did. There are certain people you find you have an enormous rapport with and acting uh, becomes much more pleasurable and indeed organic. And I had an immediate rapport with, with Sid. Marvellous, ain't it? You can't trust no one, can you? Take it easy, Johnny. Roger tipped me off about it, so I give it a working over and repainted it and broke sold it back to him. He never knew it was the same car the cops told him. That's what they call poetic justice, see? There was something about Sid. He was a natural. And if you look at some of those early films, um, he's surrounded by British actors who are playing Cockney characters. But Sid was much more at home with both the intonation and the vocabulary and the accent of London than any of them. What makes you so anxious suddenly about my health? I'd like to see my boys going stale. Stale my foot! I'm just giving you a week off, that's all. Look, when I want time, I'll take it. Either I write when I like or I don't write at all, see? Suit yourself. We'd like you to come and write for us, Bill. Maybe we can arrange it. Yes? What about his contract? Well, what about it? I'm captain of the Ilford team and I'm asking you. If you don't want him to write for well, you... Look, then... I'm manager of this team and I'm telling you. He writes when I say and how I say and where I say. Otherwise, he doesn't write at all. There was a tremendous subtlety and sensitivity to his acting, too. And he, in a film called The Small Back Room, there's a scene in a pub run by Sid with David Farrow. And Sid is being very considerate. How's the foot? Which one? The tin one. I saw you kicking at it just now. Well, I've got to do something. I can't take it off in here, can I? No more whiskey for you, Mr. Rice, not in my bar. He'd never appeared to be acting, and to act without appearing to be acting is an enormous skill. You can see that David Farrer is an actor playing drunk, whereas Sid is a publican. Ask one, Mr. Rice. What do you mean, Nuxie? I mean that I like you and Miss Susan too much to let you get stinking in my bar. That to Miss Susan, and that to you, Nuxie. Too important. Anyone ever give you a thick ear, Nuxie? Not without paying cash for it. He's a great thief, Sid. He stole so many scenes from so many actors. Um, it, it's little wonder that he wasn't given bigger parts in those early days because he was a lot better than had created a character that you remembered. I mean, long after he vanished from the screen, he was still lingered in your mind. And what is more... You wanted to know more about that man. You know, it would have been very interesting if the film had been able to follow him home and see where he lived and how he got on with his family. It, was, it's an, it takes real acting to do something like that, and, and Sid was capable of that, often. I never want to know a thing about nobody. Not even when I pick him up. I'll pay to Aberdeen, ask him for some town I never even heard of. I'll never get there before tomorrow. I think we'll have to drop you off just after we get to Perth. That'll be just after we pass that police checkpoint. But I don't think any of us three ought to worry about that. Do you, Edel? Too true, Pers. My yes, man. <laughs> Ever been inside? No. I have. Nobody ever questioned it. Nobody said, how come a geezer from Johannesburg can talk like that? What's your mate? I know he did have a big thing about Max Miller. And there is a kinship there, if you look at it. As a matter of fact, if you see an early film of J.B. Priestley's, I think it's called The Good Companions, Max Miller gives a performance in it that Sid James could have given, and there'd be little to choose between the two of them. Hello, who are you? Felder and Hunterman. Who are they? Never heard of them. No. Sorry. <laughs> They're the biggest uh, music publishing company in the world, and I'm their star traveller. Oh, thanks very much. No, don't go, don't go. It's all right. I don't want to sell you anything. Thank God for I that. I was in your show last night, and I heard some of your numbers, and they're pretty wonderful numbers. Oh, glad you think And so. I think with your personality and my brains, we should make a lot of money. Simply dissolve one of these tablets in water and you have luxury at its lowest price. Not just another detergent, oh no. It now becomes a three-in-one oil that leaves no grease. The car polished it cleans as it shines. A garden pest killer that fertilizes it at the same time. You should ask 50 pounds, 50 pounds, and, and then try and get it. <laughs> it's another joke. If he offers you a ten, I should take it. Like Max, he epitomized the true traditions of burlesque. Sid can be aligned with people like Phil Silvers in America. In fact, Sid was one of the few people I know could have played Bilko. Your Majesty, here's the proposition. You are on television, seated in a beautiful baronial hall. A butler pours you a glass of Royal Crown whiskey, and with that natural, majestic charm of yours, you say a few words and drink. I'm to advertise whiskey? I know it's beneath your dignity, Your Majesty, but there's $50,000 in there. If you don't want the money, you can give it a charity. Personally, I think it's most distasteful. Okay, King, you're the doctor. Uh, about the payment of this money, uh, when... I'm you... signing the contract. Jamier, attend to that matter at once. 
Yes, sir. Then it's a deal? Great! Now that Relic, you'll be seeing me every week, Mr. Sidney James, my friend, agent, confidant and owner. How you do? Well, I hope you like the shows. As he told you, I'm his best friend. But uh, if during the course of the series you find that you like me better than him, don't hesitate to write in and say so, because uh, I'm after show me own. We wanted someone to play a sort of a dubious bloke who used to get Hancock into scrapes every week. Such as me? Who are you? He said, ah, we don't know his name. So <laughs> we had to wait for the film to uh, creep around somewhere and we found it in a little, uh, a little uh, cinema in Notting Hill Gate and uh, we went to see it, Lavender Hill Mob, and waited for the, uh, the uh, credits to come up. And it's Sidney James, burglar, that's it. There are some cuttings if you'd like to see them. How long have you been here? Just long enough to hide when I heard you coming in. Thought I'd been taken for the mud, me. What's the job? When we first cast Sid in Hancock's half it was a radio show. And he came in to meet Hancock and, and Ray and, and Ray myself, and he said, I don't, I'm not sure whether I'm right for this, I don't think I can do it. He said, why not? He said, well, I've never done radio. He said, I'm frightened of it. I said, well, I tell you, there's nothing, there's nothing to it. All you've got to do is read it. So you go to the, go to the microphone, and he'd have the script up there, and his hat down there, and probably <laughs> the audience couldn't see his face at all. He'd be shaking. And after about two or three shows, of course, when he realised what a piece of cake it was, the hat went... The script was down there, the, 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 the uh, staples are out. Just like he'd been doing it all his life. How would you like an almost brand new saloon? Where is it? Anybody about? No. Come into my shed. There she is, over in the corner. What, that big black one? Yes, yeah, just come in today. Oh, Tony, what a lovely car. It's just what you want. Yeah, it looks almost brand new. Yeah, just one small point. What? What's your mechanic taking the number plates off for? What? <laughs> The relationship between he and Tony was he was always trying to con Tony. It was your idea to buy a car off Sidney James. Well, how was I to know he'd sell you a stolen police car? <laughs> sometimes he'd win, sometimes he'd lose. There was Sid the Gambler. Only seven jewels and he's got them all. Want to go? This could be the biggest win in history. <laughs> Here we are, Sam. Take it easy. Here, put your feet up. <laughs> Put it up there. That's it. Make yourself comfy. I'll make you a nice hot cup of tea. Relax. Your old pal Sid is here to look after you. Hello, hello. The vultures are on the move. <laughs> Take it nice and easy now. Don't worry about a thing. You know what they say? A trouble share is a trouble half. You want to share my troubles? Well, you're not going to. Not a penny. I'm having the lot. How many relations have you got? I've got hundreds of them. And how much do you think you're going to have left when they find out? They won't find out. I put my little cross in the square. No publicity. <laughs> and for a third share, I won't tell them either. The way they balanced each other was quite wonderful. Because one was the sort of Walter Mitty, airy-fairy number, and the other one was the solid, down-to-earth, now call, you know, let's see what you've got to do. I'm finished. I can't face the world anymore. Let me go. I can't face the future of a broken, ruined man. The two told me to be that strong arm all the time. I'm sure that though he always seemed very cool and calm, he must have felt nervous at times because working with someone like Tony, who before the show was a nervous wreck, <laughs> can't have made anyone feel absolute joy about the... He used to fall about laughing at it sometimes with uh, Tony, you know, some expression. I have come across the oddest business proposition that has come my way in years. No. <laughs> you haven't heard what it, what it is, even later heard what it is yet. Oh, I still haven't heard what it is. Go on, say it again. <laughs> Sid knew all about cameras, and Tony didn't know. And, uh, and Sid would say to uh, Hancock during rehearsal, you ought to have a close-up on there, and uh, have you watched, uh, watched the monitors? You know, no, no, you're right out of shot. He shouldn't make you look at Charlie in front of everybody. Go on, tell him. So Tony would go, uh, Duncan, uh, any, any chance of a close-up on the scene? And Duncan would say, yes, of course. Tony would never have thought of it, didn't know. Sid was, he, he used to be his godfather, you know, his minder. How you doing? Horrible. <laughs> Keep her there. I'm doing all right here. If yours goes, mine will go. She doesn't like me. You're all right. Yours is great. Well, come on, let's change over for a bit. <laughs> all right, I don't mind. Hello, then. Oh, hello. What's all this about going home? You don't want to go home, do you? Not now. No, I'm oh, good, you don't. I was in the back of a theatre, some premiere, and Sid said, Tony doesn't want me in the next series, and he was... he was distraught. And he hadn't been able to understand why. 
this had happened because they'd been so close. And Tony never told him. Tony never approached him and said and explained. It only happened to me. Oh, well, what's your good at complaining? Money isn't everything. So what happened subsequently was that the BBC, who, whoever the BBC may be, you know, like Pete, they, I think they had people that cared in those days. Um, so someone who cared said to Sid, look, don't be upset, we'll give you your own series. And so they gave him Citizen James. Back to the lunch you're going to buy me, is it? A salt beef sandwich and a pickled cucumber. Ah, well, it's only temporary. One of these days I'll come up with a big deal and we'll be eating at the Ritz. Yeah, the day they start selling salt beef sandwiches. <laughs> oh, look, Sid, why can't we go to that little French restaurant in Greek Street? They do a lovely menu there, real elegant. Yeah, so are the prices. I'll pay for it. What are you trying to do? Take my pride away from me? I'll probably have to pay for the salt beef sandwich, so what's the odds? It's not a principle of the thing at all. It's the money. Salt beef sandwiches are cheaper. <laughs> he was just sort of the other side of being criminal, really, but uh, he was into betting and borrowing money from me and not giving it back, and I trusted him with £250 in one episode for him to go and bank and he didn't, he gambled it, so he was always sailing near the wind. I'm not going to spend any of it. Well, what are we coming here for, then? Listen, mate, I just want to flash it, that's all. Once Charlie gets one look at this wad, our credit will be good for another six months. Yeah, but, Sid, we can't possibly... Listen, mate, listen. Banks never lend money to people who need it, only to people who don't need it. You'll never know it's not mine. Yeah, but... Listen, 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 listen. One of the first rules of business is you never spend money, you use it. Money's too valuable to spend. You just get hold of enough, to show to somebody else, to persuade them to give you some of theirs so that you don't have to spend what you showed them in the first place. <laughs> what do you do with that? You add it to what you've already borrowed, show it to somebody else and borrow twice as much from them. <laughs> and before you know where you are, you've built a great, ugly block of flats in Piccadilly Circus. Tony needed Sid more than Sid needed Tony because Sid went on to win wonderful, wonderful victories in, in his profession. I mean, all those carry-on films and the series that he did himself, where Tony went, well, painted himself into a corner. That was it. His, his career went downhill as Sid's went up. Don't tell me you believe it all started with Adam having a nibble at Eve's golden delicious. I hope I am enlightened enough to know it wasn't just her apple he was oh, after. <laughs> you see, I'm telling you, it's allegorical. It's been proved. We all come from monkeys. Oh, you haven't come very far, have you? We then had a meeting to think of another idea for Sid. And I said, he's married with a wife and family. And everybody said, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. And Sid's agent said, Sid can't do that. He's got this reputation as a bird puller. I said, with all due respects, look at Sid. He's getting older. He'll come across as a dirty old man if we're not careful. And to his credit, Sid immediately said, Vince is right. You rely so much on your writers. So much. Without your writers, you're gone. A new Sid James was born. He still had the old qualities of the old Sid James, but more identifiable. He was a family man. He was a harassed father. He had ideas about how his family should behave and they never did. And he was rather astounded, I think, about the modern, trendy son that he had. I told you I was not a why, why, why were you merely brought home in a police car? Causing a disturbance outside number 10. <laughs> number 10? That's Dr McLaren's place. What you got against him? <laughs> there was a strange resemblance between them all. They behaved like a family. Got any money, Daddy? Yes, plenty. It's all in your mother's handbag. <laughs> now comes the moment you what do you want? Just a hunter looking for some sport. The young widow at the tobacconist. You must have vetted her at least 50 times. Oh, good. I only keep going in there for me, Shag. This is my new squaw, Kitty Kata. I bought her for two buffalo skins. How? Never mind how. Where? Have you wet your trousers? Let me sure. Then we better have it off, hadn't we? Took the thought right out of my mind. Only after one thing. Why? What's the matter with the other one? <laughs> I think the one critic got it dead right. The, he said that the carry-on is the one kind of movie where they can show a nude and still keep it naughty. Well, that really is what it is. Ah! Blimey! Vic, what are you doing in here? Get out of here! 
You haven't got any soap on that bit. Sid was the perfect exponent of them. Uh, I think he was in about 19 of the films. The ones he wasn't in were not as good um, as the ones he was in. Praise where praise is due. He was nearly always the leader of the cast, the, the head of the cast. They all came under the title, you notice. I wouldn't let anybody go above the title because the star of the film, to my mind, was the two words carry on. In his shoes, I do exactly the same thing. He said, I don't care if it's two lines or 20 lines. I just want to be in it. I'm a worker! He got the same fee. Not a word of this to anybody, particularly Mr. Potter. Of course not, Mr. Fiddler. There we are, Sam. That's very nice. I won't forget. Um, they I made a lot of money. Uh, Apart from the cinema release, you couldn't go to a seaside resort in Britain in the summer without there was a carry-on at the cinema just in case it rained. It was always a great family atmosphere, and it was generated by the fact that they used mostly the same crew. It became the same artists, practically, on all of them, and the same crew. I always feel sorry for a newcomer because he... He, he feels strange, because it is really like someone coming into somebody's family. But uh, we've never ever had any trouble with newcomers, really, because we just belt them. Howdy, stranger! Nice day! Disgusting! He was good in all of them, but on Carry On Cowboy, he, he almost was the cowboy, and he loved the part. Who is this? I am the mayor! You better keep away from my horse. He ain't seen a mare in three weeks. He could have been a cowboy. I mean, he was built for the part. He could handle the guns. He had the craggy face. He was really great in that part, the rumpo kid. Bottoms up. I'll just take that gun of yours, cowboy. What for? I don't allow no shooting at my place. Lady, I wouldn't dream of shooting at your place. I'm not afraid to use this, you know. My, but you got a big one. I'm from Texas, ma'am. We all got big ones down there. My favourite, I suppose it, maybe it's everybody's favourite, is Carry On Cleo. And from that, too, there is one scene that I will never forget, and that is Sid getting up, exhausted, knackered, from Cleopatra's couch and saying, Poor, oh, poor, oh, poor. Which, as any schoolboy knows, means boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Nobody but Sid could get away with speaking Latin in a carry-on film, but it was wonderful. Because I'm not strictly a comic. I'm not a comic at all. These other blokes are comedians. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a sort of reactor. <laughs> <laughs> Sid's laugh was totally infectious and totally genuine. Certainly. Uh, laughing is not easy in, in the cinema. If you, if you think of films, of Errol Flynn films, when he's Robin Hood or The Seahawk and he slaps his thigh... And, and guffaws. You know perfectly well, watching him do it, that the director said, hang on, Errol, this is the bit where you laugh. So Errol does it, slaps his thigh and ho-ho-hos, and it's phony. But with Sid, the laughter always seemed to be utterly genuine. And the result of that was that you laughed with him. Oh, sense of humour, eh? Well, that's good, you need that in this job. Sid's attitude to the carry-on films was, it was a job. And people who messed around in those circumstances got very short shrift from Sid, very short shrift. There were certainly four or five of the top people who Sid had no time for. Who's still missing a bell? Kenneth lived in a slightly surreal world, <laughs> and, and uh, Sid lived in a very realistic one. I'm going to find out what makes you tick. Tick, sir? Psychologically speaking. I don't understand you. Well, that makes us even, because I don't understand you. I never saw a row between them, because I worked in several films with both of them. But they were obviously very different people. I'll do him one of these days. He didn't tolerate fools. And um, he'd come out with his favourite saying of, oh, they get on my tits. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? They used to petrify all actors by saying, when we were doing a recording, that it was so expensive to cut the tape. And they used to put uh, fear and trembling into us that we must get it right every time, except Sid. Oh, if we'd done one tape not as well as we could have done it, he'd just said, oh, and they had to cut it. I'm in the mood for using the right words this morning. You... I'll give you an example of his professionalism. One day I was on the set, five cameramen, as you do shooting situation comedy, and a particularly tricky scene, one Sunday morning. And I said to Sid, sit down. And I said to the others, and I said to the cameraman, Albert, you do this, camera two do that, camera three do that, four get ready for this, 
once you've had your bit, Albert, you change to do this. And this went on for about three or four minutes. And I said, have you all got it? And they said, yeah, we think so. And I said, right, let's try it. And it didn't quite work. And Sid came over to me very quietly. He said, Willie, he never called me Bill. He always called me Willie. He said, Willie, if you've got a problem with this, just put that camera over there on me and whatever happens, leave it rolling and I won't let you down. Can I help it if I'm a craftsman? The first season I did, I said, was uh, in Torquay uh, at the pavilion. It was called Wedding Fever. And Sid was such a star and such a big draw that they actually sold seats that nobody could see in. They, they sat behind pillars and things. So every now and again, if Sid and I were doing a scene t together in, in the living room of, of the, uh, the family house, as it was set, he would give me the nod, and we used to walk down stage of the dining table, right to the front, so that the people that couldn't see us got a glimpse <laughs> every now and again. Uh, he, was, he was very concerned like that, you know. I mean, I'm sure a lesser man would have just stayed where he was. He didn't just say the lines. He was thought about it. I think he, he scorned people who, who didn't know their lines or didn't bother to learn them as Sid thought they should learn them. He had that. Above all, of course, he had this unique versatility. You want a bit of grammar? Gene Kelly. Everybody loves a baby and it might as well be. Gene Kelly, oh my word. What? So tell us, where's the birdie? We're looking for the birdie, but the birdie ain't around. Yeah. 64 wing, here we go. Pull and room and took I.O. Do we want him? Hell no! What we want is D.I.R.L.S. James! In those fancy ballet tights, I'd look quite a sight. Imagine me with combinations on. But when it's for our sake, and when you're in Swan Lake, you must lose your inhibitions. <laughs> He was an optimist. The Sid was one of those rare people and envied people, people to be envied, who live for tomorrow. Tomorrow is a great day, the sun's going to shine. And, uh, and in his case, it did. <laughs> he had a great sort of lust for life, you know, I mean, he liked women and he liked his booze. I can always find it. <laughs> I used to bump into him on film sets and at cocktail parties and things. And he was the kind of person that, if you saw him there, you'd, you'd think, hey, let's go and talk to Sid. You know, he'll cheer us up. And he always did. Both Sid and Val were wonderful to me. And, you know, Val's birthday was, I think it's the 30th of December. And every year, Sid threw a wonderful party at his house, invited all his friends, show business friends. And I can see him now, Sid, standing behind the bar, dispensing the drinks, you know, laughing, chuckling. They had this lovely house, but this huge field by the side of it, and a whole gang of us, Sean Connery, Stanley Baker, Ronnie Carroll, Glenn Mason, probably Jimmy Tarbuck, and the whole gang of us went to his house, and we'd all been playing that day, and we got in the house having a few drinks, and then somebody started betting against somebody else about he could play the shot better than him, and, and, and then Sid suggested that we put all the headlines lights on the cars onto his field and that's what we did we had a golf tournament <laughs> on Sid James's field it's well known Sid was a gambler in fact it was pretty serious at one time and I think that Val said to him look Sid you, you gamble with cash or you don't gamble at all you know, and he had so you gamble with his, so you couldn't get into really be on the telephone placing a bet we all knew that when he disappeared he wasn't going to the loo he was going to put a bet on bye bye Sidney see you later and don't gamble. Oh, me? What do you think I am, a mug? <laughs> I remember on Carry On Cruising, in between takes, watching Sid sitting in his chair looking up at the ceiling. And I couldn't understand, so I followed up where he was looking, and he was looking up to the gantry, and he was actually doing a sort of tic-tac with the Sparks guy in the gantry to bet something on the 230 red car. One the time he owed a lot of money, so the inland revenue, by virtue of his gambling. I am not going under without a fight.
he was offered a part in a film called Trapeze, American film being made in, in Europe with Burt Lancaster, I think, Tony Curtis and Gene the Lola Bridget, a big, big film. And Sid was offered a great deal of money to, to play in it. The part was that of a snake charmer. To me, you don't look like a snake lover. Now, Sid had a pathological hatred of snakes. He couldn't stand being with them or looking at them or anything to do with them. But the Inland Revenue said to him, look, if you do this film with all this money, you pay it to us, we'll give you £100 a week uh, uh, pocket money, and the debt's wiped out. Want to buy a snake act? Three of the sweetest performers that ever circled a torso. He's got just a bill for it, hasn't he, Shorty? So Sid thought about that, and he said, right, I'm on. For sure, you said you'd find a buyer. I find no buyer. Everybody knows this snake killed your brother doing exactly what he's doing now. She's only a bit high-spirited, that's all. Keep her warm, it's quite safe. No. My brother let her get cold. You never dream that he had anything but the greatest affection for this snake. That's acting for you. <laughs> yes, well, either you've got it or you haven't. And you've definitely got it to <laughs> come here. He was one of the boys. I think this is part of the secret of his success with ladies. You know, Sidney, sometimes you're so rough and earthy. I'm delighted to say. <laughs> if he met a girl and she caught his eye, he was like a big, shaggy dog. His tail started wagging. And the face showed it, you know, it was alive. How about a bit of fun tonight? Oh, no, brother. Bless you, my children. I don't know if he appealed to the girls, because he, I, he, I, uh, I wasn't uh, attracted to him particularly. You know, he wasn't my type. I've never heard anything so ridiculous in my life. But a lot of girls fell for him. Really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> they must know a secret I don't know. You drug them, don't you? <laughs> I do not. I charm them. Give them the old chat. No, I'm not kidding. This is a nerve test. Really? A test for steady nerves, oh. steady hands. Now, you know, you'll never drive a truck if you can't hold these like this. Oh. Oh, you're not going to burn me. No, no. Oh, no, steady. No, no. Oh. Now, this is where it comes very important. You've got to hold still up. now. Uh, Are you ready? Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> he was truly. A ladies' man, there's no doubt about it. Bloody good company. Simple as that. He was a great mate. Uh, I think we probably flirted. Yeah. Cute, isn't it? Isn't it? It's the smallest I could find. That's a racing certainty. He never went any further than that. I mean, I could cuddle him. Not many men I, I want to cuddle, but I could cuddle Sid. He was very good with the ladies, as we all know, but as I was pregnant, uh, it didn't really come <laughs> into the question at that time. I remember I had to do a, what I call a vampy scene, you know, with not very much on. I was shy, and I sat there on the side of the set with a rug over my legs, and he said, you've got the best legs in the business, take that rug off your, you know, take, stop wrapping yourself up in cellophane and took the rug away from my leg and as he stood up, he tapped my knee, he said, you needn't worry about me, you know, I'm very discreet. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I took that as a, uh, as just as a joke, which I'm sure it was. Right now I'd like to get out of my bath. Oh, uh, give you a hand? No, no, but you can pass me a towel if you like. Yeah. Here you are. All right, I won't look. No? He was naughty, wasn't he? He was naughty, the twinkle in the eye. Yeah, well, uh, it was uh, nice uh, seeing you. And you too, you were very sweet to me. He was just such a lovely person, and it just came across in whatever role he was playing. There was a play at the National Theatre based on Sid and an alleged liaison with Barbara Windsor. I knew them both. Uh, I never saw anything untoward in their relationship. Oh, I'm sure there's some quite innocent explanation. I have heard stories about Sid. As far as I'm concerned, to me, he was a happily married man. Where have I gone wrong? I mean, I tried to be a good husband and father. I thought it was disgusting that somebody could write a play like that and the tabloids could pick all this up and write about Sid when his widow was still alive and his children were still alive, and his grandchildren were still alive. How can people do this to a man, destroy his reputation, whether the facts were true or not? I mean, there's such a thing as common decency, and you don't do that. What have I done to deserve this? He talked about Val a great deal, and I remember they were giving a, a lovely big party, 
And then the night before, Sid rang up, absolutely distraught. Um, Val had miscarried. There were two. There were twins. And he was in a terrible state. And again, my husband and I talked to him on the phone for about 25 minutes. He was really de desperately upset, as anybody would be. So that's, that's the private man, Sid, that I knew. He was told by the doctor that he must stop smoking cigarettes. He must stop drinking brandy. And he must stop betting on the horses, because it was very dangerous. Perhaps you're right. So Sid did. He stopped smoking cigarettes and smoked cigars. And he stopped drinking brandy and drank whiskey. And he started betting on the dogs instead of the horses. He was driving himself too hard. Hart couldn't stand it. He died in 1976 on stage after failing to respond to a cue. He just died like that. And he promised himself and his wife, Valerie, that he would retire when he was 65. And he died when he was 63. That is terrible, terrible. I remember very, very clearly uh, the last time I saw him was uh, during the tour uh, in which he died. And he said, oh, how great to see you. Because things were going absolutely marvellous for me, you know. Why are you being served and hit the roof and everything was very, very nice. Uh, and he said, come in, come in, quick, shut the door. Now, let's have a drink. And then he looked straight at me and said, isn't it great? Meaning, isn't it great you've made it or you have been recognised and people know who you are? Good boy. He was so excited for me that it had all worked. And I can hear him now saying, isn't it great? <laughs> I think meaning, isn't it nice, you know, when they say, hello, could I have your autograph, please? <laughs> The reason Sid struck a chord with the British public was because of his ordinariness, or what they thought was his ordinariness. Because he wasn't actually an ordinary man, really. He was a very complicated man. He wasn't always quite certain whether acting was a serious job for a man, for a grown-up chap. And although he, he was good at it and he took it seriously, I'm not quite sure if he was a... It wasn't a square peg in a round hole. I think more like a 50 pence piece, you know, that fits into a round hole but only touches around. I think that was true of Sid as an actor. <laughs> you know what I mean? He seemed to be everybody's friend, everybody's next-door neighbour. An actor who definitely had no sell-by date. Do you know what I mean? He, if Sid had been alive today, he'd still be working and making people laugh. He'd make a bleeding good landlord of the boozer in EastEnders. It'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? How about the other half? Eh? Another one of those. Oh, it's all. Have you got a large one? I've had no complaints so far. <laughs> he was the sun in the morning and a romantic in the moonlight at night. That was Sid. And uh, thinking of that, he, the sun, he, he'd make a very good face on that sun in the Teletubbies. If you could think of that St James face looking down on those funny things, it would be the perfect face. The baby's lovely, but Sid would have been just that. <laughs> you couldn't miss him, could you? You miss him now, but, I mean, you could never miss him when he was around. That thing I can categorically say, there is no Sid James anywhere, nor will there ever be. He was a one-off. Oh, come and see your Napoli, it's all the same to you and me, and that's where we would like to be, as long as we can go and see the happy, happy, great, and sad faces of the people we love. That's Sid James. He was a natural at being natural. There isn't anything else I can say except thank you very much. Yeah.